and get started. Okay, so um, as I said, uh, my name is Stephen Cousins and I'm the founder of Bluebird Exchange CIC. And yeah, this evening I'm here to discuss the role of circular economy in relation to environmentalism, the outdoor industry, and in particular snow sports, because that's why we're all here. So just to start, I'm gonna run through a bit of an agenda. So what we're going to talk about kind of today, how the, how the talk is going to go down and what we're going to, so you have a bit of an idea. And then if you really hate the look of what I'm talking about, you can, uh, you can duck out early. Um, so we're just going to start with about, about us, uh, a bit of chat about the climate issue. Um, we're then going to go on to do an introduction to circular and linear economy. And then we're going to look at how that intersects with snow sports. I'm going to touch a little bit on the idea of greenwashing and how that's kind of trickling into circular economy rhetoric and then we're going to go on to just with a few conclusions pretty standard stuff okay so to start i'm just gonna run a bit about us just so you've got a bit of background kind of what what we do um so we are bluebird exchange cic um we're an edinburgh based social enterprise looking to tackle the environmental impacts of our outdoor gear through ideas of reuse, repair and sharing. And we also like to promote a circular economy. So these are a bunch of pictures which just kind of show what we've done. So the lovely orange jacket um, on the left hand side is a, an example of some snow sports uniform uh, we received, which we patched up um, and then got back in circulation. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of a repair on the grey jacket. Uh, that picture is of me at the top of a mountain um, and the picture on the right is my good friend Johnny who is uh, modelling an item that was donated to us by Ian Innes who is a former ski club um, team GB uh, snow sports uh, uh, downhill skier sorry he's a former team GB downhill skier um, and these other bits of mob. So we're currently working with the University of Edinburgh on a project to uh, locate and redistribute and repair uh, old children's uh, outdoor apparel. So we have lots of jackets, fleeces that we're getting from schools which are not being used and we're redistributing those to children in and around the Edinburgh area. And um, finally, we were shortlisted for the Plastic Free Awards, which some of you might have seen was a, was a big award ceremony by Surfers Against Sewage. Um, so we are a social enterprise, which means all revenue we generate from our business activity is reinvested into our primary missions, which I will come on to now. So our missions are pretty straightforward. So the first one is to keep outdoor gear in circulation. So as an industry, we're still obsessed with the idea of buying new gear. This creates a huge amount of waste and has pretty enormous environmental repercussions when it comes to our carbon waste and water footprints. So we want to kind of break this cycle of consumerism and instead focus on keeping gear in circulation for longer. Our second mission is to promote circular economy in the outdoor community. And we do that through talks like this. So thank you, Daisy and the Ski Club of GB for, for helping us do this. Um, because we kind of recognize that we can't just build circular solutions in isolation and expect people to embrace them. The first thing is that we need to raise awareness about what is circular economy, what is linear economy, and what, what's the benefits of transitioning from one to the other, which I hope to do in this talk. So kind of knowledge is power, and we all need to be aware of the existing issues and potential solutions before we consider, can consider moving towards a different system. So our second mission, promoting circular economy, focuses on just that. Um, so that's probably enough about us. Um, I will move on quickly now to this date. So 29th of July, 2021. Now, does anyone know, and if you could, I think we have access to the chat box here, which I should be able to see. So if um, anyone, does anyone know what this date actually is? I'm just gonna see if I can actually find the chat box here. Well, 
Well, I can't see the chat box, so I'm just going to continue anyway. It doesn't matter. I can, Daisy, uh, see, Stephen, uh, I can see... I can see oh, the chat can box, see the chat so box, um, if anyone if does wanted... want to let us know. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give it a second, but I think it's probably probably safe to, to continue. So, so this date, the 29th of July 2021, which is coming up pretty quickly, is what's called Earth Overshoot Day. So as the slide suggests, Earth Overshoot Day marks the date when humanity's demand for ecological resources and services in a given year exceeds what the earth can regenerate in that year. So pretty much when we reached the 29th of July, 2021, we have used all of the earth's resources that it can regenerate in one year. So to put that into perspective, at our rate of resource consumption, we would need one point, it's roughly 1.6 planet earths to regenerate the amount of resources that we are consuming. So, I mean, put simply, we're using more resources that can be regenerated in any given year. So it's fair to say that something needs to change. So this next slide shows how this is kind of interacted on a, on a global level and across time. So I'm not gonna spend too long on this, but this is to just give a bit of an in indication about how this issue is playing out across uh, across time periods. So as you can see in 1970, it was right up at December. We were pretty much at one earth. And progressively as we've got towards this, this runs until 2020, but, um, but the date's actually gone down dramatically since 2020. Um, we've, we've, we've kind of, we've gone down quite a lot. Um, so on a global level, our glo global demand for resources increased since the 1970s. Um, and it demonstrates that our current lifestyle is obviously not sustainable. And arguably, there are other factors involved, of course, but part of this problem comes from a global reliance and obsession with what is a linear econ economic framework. So let's. So the linear status quo. So linear economy is the prevalent economic model across the globe for pretty much all of our products. And that is take. So the first stage of the linear economic model is take. So you collect raw materials from the ground, like this oil rig here. Make, so you transform that into products and dispose. So that's then disposed, discarded as waste at end of life. I guess there's a, there's a stage kind of in between make and dispose, which is generally use. And that can be as long or as short as the person who owns the product um, desires. So this, as I said, is the prevalent economic model across the globe for pretty much all of our products. So that includes all of the ski jackets we own, all of these jackets here. Well, I guess we're kind of making them slightly more circular now, which I'll get onto, but all of the ski jackets we own, our skis, even this table that I've sat my laptop on, pretty much everything relies on this take, make, dispose attitude. This relies on the relentless extraction of raw materials to manufacture products, which are then obviously disposed of. So the issue with this is that the linear economic model places an enormous burden on the ecological balance of our planet. So all three steps of the take, make and dispose mentality affect the ecosystem services in, in different ways. So to so the first in the take section, so the collection of raw materials leads to huge amounts of energy and water consumption, emissions of toxic substances and disruption of natural capital, such as forests, lakes, even the oceans with oil extraction, that's happening a lot off the North Sea here. So obviously then you've got the make stage, so product formation, and it's often accompanied with high energy and water consumption, toxic emissions, again, and eventually when these products are discarded, so in the disposal stage, space is taken up from natural areas and toxic substances often also emitted. And as we've grown really accustomed to in the last couple of years since uh, David Attenborough made his documentary, plastics, obviously the obvious one in the disposal and how it can disrupt ecosystems and marine life and pretty much everything. And I just read uh, something today that they found microplastics at the top of Mount Everest, all the way down to the bottom of the Marinara Trench. So there are issues pretty much 
are all three stages along the linear status quo. Now, linear economy and consumerism are kind of two sides of the same coin. The linear economy model works because we, as consumers, continue to purchase new things in a consumerist society. But that leads to some pretty devastating results. So I've got some statistics here. So every second, you might have seen this, every second the equivalent of a rubbish truckload of clothes is burnt or buried in landfill. Uh, we have enough clothes on the planet to cater for the next six generations. And the fashion industry produces more carbon emissions than all international flights and maritime shipping combined. So this linear economy fosters this idea of consumerism. The more products that can be sold, the more money a company can make. So working that backwards then means that the company has to take and make in the linear economic cycle more stuff. And they do that indefinitely. So this means that companies have gone to extraordinary lengths to ensure we, the, the consumer, want to continually purchase their products. That's why, if you think about it, that's why ski jacket manufacturers have a different color scheme every year um, because the technology might not have changed all that much and oftentimes it hasn't changed at all, but they need to encourage people to purchase new, new products. So while this whole idea of linear economy and consumerism might be really great for companies and in, to a certain extent it's great for consumers with the addition of choice and kind of the, that warm fuzzy feeling you get when you buy something new it creates a bit of a perfect storm for the natural world and the model is inherently unsustainable and doesn't really fit with a forward-thinking approach to environmentalism and sustainability before so so these figures that and these statistics that are up on the slides here have come from the fashion industry um, so the fashion industry has kind of commissioned a lot of research into the impacts of the, uh, the fashion industry and you will have heard terms like fast fashion and things like this so so a lot of this research has been done by organizations such as RAP or um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, and you, you might think fast fashion and the outdoor industry, particularly snow sports industry, are kind of far cry from each other. It, that they're, they're not the same thing, they don't relate at all. But, but really, we kind of see that slightly differently. We think the reality of the situation is that the outdoor industry is pretty guilty of jumping on the fast fashion bandwagon and promoting this unsustainable consumerist attitude to drive sales because ultimately their revenue comes from the sale of more products and the sale of more products requires the relentless extraction and manufacture of said products. So as an, as an industry, the snow sports industry and the outdoor industry are very much part of the problem even though we don't necessarily care to admit that so while specific research is yet to be conducted in the outdoor space i think if it was the results might actually be even more shocking than traditional fast fashion the reason being that a lot of the products we manufacture are made out of plastic which as everyone knows um can cause huge damage to our ecosystems throughout the life cycle. So is there a solution? Well, I think there is. So that's where circular economy comes in. So the concepts of circular economy suggests a framework to address this problem. It suggests an alternative to the traditional linear economy model. So circular economy is a different system in which we want look to rebalance our relationship with the natural world. So unlike a linear economic model, the concept of a circular economy is that the economic activity itself rebuilds the overall health of the system in which it exists, rather than in a linear economic model where the system is constantly getting degraded, the system being 
our planet is constantly being degraded within a circular economy all activity is rebuilding the overall health of the system so a circular, a circular economy for outdoor gear and clothing for example especially in the snow sports world can be founded on the basic principles of eliminating waste um, keeping products and material in use and regenerating natural systems but kind of our bluebirds we've tried to boil this down to something even more simple so we think primarily increasing the product life cycle of our existing outdoor gear is the most impactful way to participate in circular economy and the statistic on the right of the slide really demonstrates that so increasing the product life cycle of an item by nine months can reduce its carbon waste and water footprints by up to 30 percent and that goes up the longer you use that item so the carbon waste and water savings for simply increasing the product life cycle of your item can have dramatic effects going forward so if we were to just keep our stuff in circulation longer we can have a real impact in what we do so again daisy i think i do i can see the the q a um the chat function but i'm gonna i'm gonna maybe dare to use the the q a function for this so this is a question um maybe maybe we'll use the chat box again so for how long do you think and this is not related to uh to to snow sports specifically but for for how long do you think the average american uses an electric drill before disposing of it now i can see oh, here we go so we've got i hope you don't mind me calling it calling it out so uh we've got three years is um total answer so we're talking just for context it's how long is the drill actually in use for so that's the, it's its entire product life cycle so 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 uh, we've got three years here on the chat we've got five years ten years so five hours um i would love to say you are all correct but no one is anywhere near um it's actually remove these 10 minutes. So the average American uses an electric drill for a total of 10 minutes throughout its entire life cycle. They might own that drill for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, five years, one year, but the, the average actual use of that drill is 10 minutes. Now, because I was trying to kind of put this into perspective of snow sports, but for for all of us, um, and obviously I'm a I'm a big skier myself. There's a there's a question that I'm the next question is something I'm gonna ask. So how many days a year do you think you use your ski jacket? So again, if just ping it on the on the chat, I think I can see the chat and the and the QA. Um I know for me before doing seasons, I probably did a, a week a year, so so probably seven days. So we've got 14 days, 20 days, 20 days. So we're kind of, we're all below a month generally um, so far. And I'm sure some people probably live in the mountains. So we've got 40 days coming up. Um, 20 seems to be, uh, seems to be a common one that's coming through. Yeah, another 20 days. Yeah, okay, so it's generally about 20 days on average. So the outdoor industry and seasonal sports like skiing and snowboarding in particular have this kind of paradoxical relationship with the natural world. So on the one hand, I guess we adore it because it provides us with so much beauty and entertainment. I know some of the best days of my life have come when I've been skiing and I've got to kind of the bottom of the slope and I've been reminiscing about the day and it's just amazing. But on the other hand, we're quite happy to destroy maybe the, the environment that we so rely on. So we're all like this to varying extent, but in the snow sports industry, the paradox is kind of particularly stark given our reliance on the natural world for the activity that we love. Because when it comes down to it, without snow, we can't, we can't ski. So 
the reason for asking you this question was was simply to just try and think in terms of the the drill being used for 10 minutes a ski jacket obviously skiing being a seasonal activity being used for say 20 days a year that means for the other i'm not going to do the maths but let's say three like 345 days of the year that that item is not in use so from a product life cycle perspective a lot of that time is being spent in in a cupboard or hung up on a shelf uh, you can't see at the moment but i've got lots of jackets behind me which are currently not in use so th there needs to be we're looking at kind of ways to increase the product life cycle of this and i've had a, there's a lot of people in the chat saying that they've had the jacket for four years five years which is which is amazing which is which is great and the longer we use these items and the longer we use these jackets the further we can no the the more the increase sorry the the more we increase the product life cycle of said item so you might use it for 20 days a year but use it for 10 15 years in which case you don't need to buy another jacket for 10 15 years which is a really positive thing but there's there are certain ideas so in in america there are ideas of uh so we get into sharing and things like this. So, for example, people have bought one ski jacket between four and they all go different weeks a year. So then that jacket is being used four times. So for, say, not 20 days, but 40 or 60 days, not overlapping. But simple things like that can really maximise the product life cycle and it can also reduce instead of three people having to buy each jacket individually. Uh, they can club together and buy one single jacket, which can be used three separate times in one year. There are simple things like that that we can implement going forward. Okay. So we've kind of tried to boil this down at Bluebird into a bit of a decision-making tree i guess a bit of a flow chart um i do realize this might be quite small and some people's screens who are viewing this on smaller screens but i'll i'll run through it with you so at, at the top we've got so you stop using your your outdoor product so you stop using your your ski jacket for whatever reason so the first question you can ask yourself is what well, is the product still in working order if the product is then can you resell the item or donate the item to give it a new home to make sure you're maximizing the product life cycle? If no, then you go through the following things. So can the item be repaired? If yes, then repair the item um, yourself or have it repaired by a professional and then kind of go back to the start. If no, then can the item or any, item, any elements of the item be recycled or repurposed? So then recycle the whole or any elements of the product if yes, and if no, can the item be repurposed as a whole? So repurpose the item. And only after going through those steps and you come out with no, then do you dispose of to landfill, but only as a last resort. And then you then come to the second part of the discussion, which is, so you want to get a kind of quote unquote new product. And then you just follow this through. So first question you should ask is, do you, do you really need the, the product in the first place? No, well then, you don't have to buy it if yes so then you go through can you rent or borrow the product from a friend instead of owning it in the first instance so if yes then rent or borrow the item for the period of which you need if no then can you you're then on to the next stages where you're going to be purchasing the item but can you purchase the item second hand in the first instance if yes then obviously purchase the item second hand with the added benefit that will probably be cheaper than a new, new item anyway. And only having gone through all of those steps and answered no to all of them, should we then be thinking about purchasing a new item? And when we're purchasing a new item, we can then ask the questions like, is it a transparent and responsible brand? But that should be at the end of the discussion. So there seems to be a bit of a something happening in the snow sports industry where we seem to be skipping a lot of steps and uh, we jump right to the bottom, which is purchase a new item from a transparent and responsible brand. But we think to really implement circular economy going through the entire process, 
we need to really think, well, first and foremost, do we really need the products in the first place? And then, and then look at these kind of sharing options through rental or borrowing, and then look at reuse through second hand, and then look at purchasing a new item only after all of those. And I haven't yet mentioned, but throughout the product life cycle, there should be a lot on repair and maintaining that product to ensure you're maximizing its product life cycle. And I know the ski club are doing a talk next week on how to maintain your skis. So that really flows into, into this topic of the discussion. So if we follow this flow chart through, it can be a really helpful guide to implementing circular economic thinking into your purchasing decisions, but also your decisions at end of life through concepts such as reuse, repair and sharing. So kind of before we finish, I think there's one thing in, and I've kind of alluded to it and it's the unhappy thorn in the side of a lot of the circular economy movement and the wider sustainability and the wider sustainability movement. And this is the kind of idea of greenwashing. And I'm sure many of you have heard the term and I'm not gonna go into it in too much detail, um, but in principle, it's the idea of kind of paying lip service to an environmental practice um, to improve your reputation through kind of benefit PR or just public perception, um, while not actually having any real tangible positive impact. Um, so circular economy really, isn't immune to this type of practice. So as brands and companies see the change in consumer behavior, everyone's becoming much more environmentally conscious. Um, they're being forced to change their messaging, which is fair enough. And some people are doing this in an authentic way and some people not so much. So many of the companies that are doing this are kind of entrenched within a linear economic system that relies on unsustainable practices of manufacturing products to sell over and over and over again. So it's just something to bear in mind when confronted with a glossy advertising campaign that no doubt shouts about its eco credentials, that if the ultimate ambition of that campaign is to get you to buy a new item, then this is pretty much completely missing the point of circular economy in the first instance. So as the quote on the right of the slide says, the circular economy is much more than reducing the harm of our existing linear model. A circular economy is about completely rethinking our purchasing decisions. It's about completely rethinking our attitude to end of life decisions. So to simply make a less, so lots of companies produce sustainable products when in reality, they're just less bad than the products were before. They might still be pretty bad, but they're just slightly less bad. So as we say, circular economy rhetoric is starting to be used by brands as a marketing tactic. And again, this flies in the face of circular economy and perpetuates a consumerist linear system. When instead we should be promoting reuse, repair, sharing of our existing products rather than continually perpetuating the cycle of always buying new. So to kind of draw this to a close, because I realize I've been kind of speaking for a while, um, some conclusions. So the first one, reuse. So reusing gear is the most direct way of keeping it in circulation. Um, so secondhand should become the new, new. I, this slide actually used to say secondhand should become the new normal, but obviously we've changed that now because of all the negative con connotations. So we just kind of came up with secondhand should be the new, new. So don't buy new, um, but have a look at secondhand in the first instance, because that is a way of, even if you're not reusing that, if you're not continually using that product for the extent of its possible life cycle, then someone else might. Second conclusion, repair. So it's all too easy to ditch a broken product and buy new. Um, and I think we do really need to get back to the idea of repairing and keeping our treasured items going, which is something that we're obviously really keen on from some of the items that we have behind me, which I think I might get to demonstrate to you in a moment. Uh, the third one, share. So sharing is a great way and it obviously fits with reuse, but it's a great way to keep items in circulation. So if we share our outdoor gear more, we don't all need to purchase a new item for 
one day week or as we found out with the ski jackets for your 20 days you can share that among multiple people and really reduce your impact and the final one is beware so just watch out for companies stuck in a linear model using tokenistic sector economy schemes as a way to sell more new stuff which is out there and it is happening and um i think just to sign off i think as environmental enthusiasts we really do have this unique relationship with the natural world so i therefore think we have this unique opportunity to completely change our relationship with our gear to minimize our environmental impact so and now with the weight of public opinion shifting is a really great opportunity to get started and i will just quickly turn to so if you've got any questions please put them in the q a box or, or the chat box um, Ah, an interesting question in the chat box. So isn't this lecture a greenwash by the ski club, essentially an industry that encourages more people to travel for leisure, to use fossil fuels, to ride up a hill, to build large resorts and infrastructure in pristine environments? No, but no, I write this as a dedicated skier, except that skiing is completely anti-ethical to my environmental aspirations. I might just ski jackets 18 years old. Um, well, yeah, pretty much. But I think there's an acceptance by all of us that there is an impact that comes from snow sports and from skiing and there's a there's a choice to be made i guess in this instance that ski club and i'm not going to speak for ski club could take the position that they don't want to talk about these issues or they could talk about these issues um and if they would like to talk about these issues i'm always happy to talk about these issues um and it's great to see that your uh, jacket is 18 years old. That's that's going on. Mine's mine's 11. So hopefully I'll. Uh, well, I'm not going to catch you up if you keep using it, but uh, we we shall see. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen here so I can see properly. Stop sharing. We've got a screen. question in the Q and A for you, Stephen. How can skis be recycled? Ah, tricky. Know. <laughs> um, so skis at the moment are a really interesting one so hard plastics are really challenging to be recycled so we have a so well for example we have some ski boots at the moment that are hard plastic and they have been donated to us and we've essentially taken on responsibility for either getting them back into circulation or recycling them um, but the issue is, especially where we are in Scotland, the recycling of hard plastic is kind of non-existent at the moment. And there are some trial schemes that are happening. But if you were to take a pair of skis, I think at the moment there isn't the technology necessarily to recycle those. But what you can do is you can, so local ski um, companies and local companies such as ourselves, are often willing to take stuff like this on. Um, you can upcycle these products, so people make furniture from them. But until we have the technology to actually separate plastics from the wood core, from these other things, then you can't really recycle them at the moment. Sorry, I'm 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 drifting. So so there are, and this is the thing. This is the beauty of circular economy and all of these things. It's the industry hasn't really tapped into or found a lot of the answers. So it's a, it's a completely wide open field. Like I do, I do not claim to have all of the answers. I barely claim to have any of the answers. But, um, but as technology moves towards these wider things, I'm sure we'll see a lot of investment going into this field in the, last, in the next couple of years. And maybe hopefully in a couple of years, I can answer your question with a very specific answer of how to answer skis. Um, Sorry, I'm just reading uh, a couple of the questions. So uh, is there an industry standard that recognizes those companies that truly adopt the circular philosophy? So at the moment, I don't think anyone specifically is talking about circular economy and the industry standard of how to implement that. Again, because this is a new kind of theory which is coming out, it's a bit like the Wild West. Um, so similar to how sustainability is 
quite the, the term sustainability is quite poorly managed but i think as as i said you've got to look at when when looking at circular initiatives you've got to look at a brand or a company it's kind of like what are their what's their inherent business model and what do they what do they do at the core of their business and and if there's no kind of real commitment to change that business model if it's a linear business model then i i think there is definitely going to be a tokenistic element to to their circular economy action um so it needs to be this real tangible change to a business model which they must recognize is outdated and does not fit with a with a um with an environmental future sorry i'm just so another how do you think we can put pressure on retailers to repair stuff it's so not in their interest to do so great question um and it's something that we've been thinking about a lot um so i think as consumers there's this kind of action there's this kind of there's this top-down approach i guess which people think which is government action creates intervention so the only way that we can put pressure on the retailers is through government whereas there's another approach which is kind of bottom up, which says that the consumer can drive the, the change at the retailer level. I think it's going to be a bit of both. So I definitely see there's a there's a changing of the wind when it comes to um, environmentalism in the outdoor industry and in brands generally. So brands have to react to the consumer change and the consumer shift in attitudes towards environmentalism and repair. The more we have discussions like this about the importance of repair, the more we're going to see consumers demanding that. And there are and there are brands and retailers at the moment that do do repair. And if you the th and and the thing is, if the brands don't do it, someone will come in and do it for them because there is a market for this repair. So ultimately the pressure, it might not be, it might not be worth it but in, the, in the first instance, because if you can go to an independent provider that can repair your products, then maybe we don't need the brands to do it in itself. So I think the answer is they'll have to, they'll have to change or they'll get, they'll get left behind ultimately. And it might not be in the next year, it might not be in the next two years, but definitely in the next sort of five to 10, I think we'll see this massive shift. Um, is there an effective way of re-waterproofing new ski anoraks and trousers? So there's a, there's a product called Nick Wax, which is um, for waterproofing. I'm not sure if it would work on ski anoraks and trousers. I'll have to check on that one, but this is Hubert. Sorry for, I'm probably butchering your the pronunciation of your, of your name um but i can uh i can uh, get back to you it does work really well yeah so everyone's got a kind of that's good so nick wax is uh we've got a thumbs up for nick wax from allison here so um so that's good we've used it um once but i can't i must admit that it's not uh we haven't actually had been able to test it it's been quite sunny here uh, in the last few days so uh, so we haven't been able to test it just quickly before we go i just wanted to um I know we mentioned at the, at the beginning some of the stuff that we've been working on. So I just thought it'd be quite nice to um, to share some of that with you. So this, for example, is a is a jacket we got donated by to uh, by a ski school, and um, it had a big. So obviously, ski schools when they when the jackets kind of stop getting used, they don't want your average Joe purchasing the jacket and skiing around. Kind of doing the classic pizza chips thing they want their ski instructors to look really amazing which is fair enough um so in giving up the jacket to us they had the caveat that we needed to debrand it so we put a little patch on here and a patch on the back and this is a nice burton ak jacket that we worked in and we're currently doing a project with um with a with a school which is what all of these tiny little items of clothing i think this is a sort of five to six jacket with um with edinburgh uni to to take a lot of these outdoor items that are unused and we're going to do a similar thing they've got a a logo on the on the on the pocket which the which the schools don't want to um 
which the schools don't want going out there for anyone to, to wear. So we're debranding those and we're going to get those recirculated in the, in the Edinburgh community, which should be quite good. So we're excited. Uh, we're excited for that. Um, I think I'm not sure if anyone else has got any more questions. So someone else has just posted in Nick Wax for and Granges for reproofing in a jacket and trousers. So I hope that's I hope whoever Hubert you've you've seen that um, and uh, you've you've made a note. <laughs> um, but I think unless there are any other questions, I think that's if um, nice. anyone does have any questions um, post talk that they've been thinking about, feel free to send them over to us, um, and then we can pass them on to Stephen to answer your questions. Yeah. Yeah, of um, course. Thanks very much, Stephen. Super yeah, helpful. Nice. I definitely will be taking away <laughs> some top tips on not rebuying clothes every single year. Um, yeah, no, ski club are, me. I know we touched on a little bit, the ski club are trying to do our bit um, slowly but surely, uh, mostly on educating our members and, and people in the industry or using our partners like Stephen and um, educate our members in the industry on on how to do small bits to you know change their behavior to make sure our industry that we love is is here for as many years as possible um so if you do have any top tips or any advice that you want to send into the ski club on things that you think might work for us um or members might want to know then then do let us know um and we can kind of send those out um, as and when we get the chance um someone did put on the q a can we share the slides with you all yes we can definitely get those the slides from the presentation sent across to to all of you and we'll also be posting um the webinar um, on our youtube channel as well so if you want to go back and rewatch it or share it to your to your friends and family please do um our next talk uh, is next week as stephen touched on it's with butter who are going to be teaching any of you who want to turn up how to service and maintain your skis to prolong their life. Um, so that's next Thursday and you can find all the details on the Ski Club website. Um, thank you very much for all coming. And yeah, let us know if you have any questions and we'll be sure to answer those. Thanks, Daisy. Oh, and just if no anyone worries. wanted any more um, information on circular economy, we do have a whole page dedicated to it on our website, which is www.bluebirdexchange.co.uk. So there's a whole page which goes through a lot of this information and it has the um the helpful flow chart on it as well so um so head over head over to that if you if you missed anything but of course we'll send over the slides as well perfect thank you everyone for joining and thanks Stephen again cheers daisy cheers bye